All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, our next speaker is a maker of robots and gadgets known very well in the community as Odd J. His talk today will take us through his adventures in making companion robots and his latest forays into adding more intelligence into his animatronics and artistic creations. Please welcome to the Hackaday Supercon stage, Jorvan Odd J Moss. Hello. Come on, say hi to the people. Don't be scared. I am IJ. This is Orbit. Orbit, say hi. As good as we're going to get. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I want to go to you guys um, through my design guide to robotics, which, as you, if you do follow me, and I hope you guys do, I have a very interesting concepts and ideas when it comes to designing my robots. Excuse me, sir. Don't, don't drive off. Please don't. All right. A little about me, my name is Dravon Moss, also known as IJ. I'm a level 30 artificer, AKA I've been alive for 30 years. Um, I have an art degree in illustration from the Academy of Art University of San Francisco, and I've been professionally making since 2019. One of my biggest and personally favorite projects has been my steampunk goggles that ended up on the cover of Mick Magazine back in 2021, I believe that was. was that? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So the three main topics I'm going to go over are shape, color, uh, shape, color theory, and illusion of life. These are the three main concepts I personally think of when making my robots, because they're the three things that end up happening in psychology regardless. Of course, this is like one of my sketches from I was building my robot Dexter, which I brought to last in life person Supercon hack a day, and it was pretty popular. So I thought I'll show you guys the crazy sketch pattern to get there. All right. So first thing first is shapes. I learned in art school that shapes are the, probably the most important thing when it comes to creating anything or everything. Why? Because we're human and we're just weird like way. But the first important thing is always to make sure that your silhouette can be seen and noticed in any design you do. So example, we have, of course, Mickey, Donald, the Flintstone guy, Ren and Stimpy, and Bart Simpson, who are just simple shapes. They're all just circles, squares, ovals. I honestly, Ren and Stimpy, there's a whole bunch of different ovals. They're very interesting with that. And Bart, who's like a giant square for a head with spikes on it. So shapes are very important. Shapes influence us both psychologically and also kind of how we view things in general, especially when it comes to robots. A good example is R2-D2. Yes, I'm using pop culture as a reference, but here we are. Um, R2-D2 is a trash can. I stand by this. There is nothing cool or design-wise to R2-D2. He is literally just a trash can with wheels. But it helps him, though. He looks so not threatening. Like, have you guys ever watched Star Wars and wonder why they never shoot the droids? Look at it. I wouldn't be scared of that either. I have a lot of other problems to worry about. So even like even his shadow silhouette is super noticeable. It's just a giant oval. But at the end of the day, he's a trash can. Another example, which I don't like doing this myself. I try to avoid this. Human designs. The human shape is never really that good, in my opinion, when it comes to making any type of robotic design because it hits Uncanny Valley. And no matter how you do it, it still looks creepy. Like, this is from Mitchell's and the Machines. And it's a great movie. It was still one of those, you know, robot take over the world movies. But in the movie, the robot draws a face on itself. And it does not make it look any less creepier. It just, it, it kind, it's kind of worse. So when it comes to shapes, I always tell people, Keep shapes in mind. So if you want to go for something a little bit less serious, go for more rounded, oval shapes. If you're going for something a lot more sinister, square, sharp edges, those type of things. But those are just small details that you can think about when you're working on uh, your own robotic designs. And of course, here's my own example of using this with uh, my current robot, which is on my shoulder. I don't think I've introduced you guys. This is FUR, F-R-R, for Facial Recognition Robot. This is my go out to these events and wear a robot, robot with me. It looks around for faces. As soon as it sees a face, it'll turn green for a second, and then it'll look at you for a second, and then look away. Why? Because I had it stare back in zero two, and everyone kept doing this, and I got real old real fast. So <laughs> now I've learned don't let your robot stare, because one, it's rude, and two, people will have way too much fun with that. 
But during this process, I went through the same type of concepts I just said with shape. So I went with an oval shape for the head that ended up being more of a square design when I finally went 3D with it. Um, but I wanted to go for more like less sinister style originally. I mean, the legs still make it look kind of creepy, but in a very cool way, like very cool sci-fi spider robot thing, and I'm here for that. All right. Next, color theory. Of course, we all know about color theory. Everyone has a basic knowledge of basic color theory. Red makes us hungry, that's why McDonald's uses it, also good for passion. Um, other colors, orange is probably, is supposed to make you go insane if you look at orange for too long, but I haven't tested that yet. I'll paint my room later. Um, <laughs> but that's just one of the ideas. But when it comes to color theory and robotics, I often recommend trying to avoid the color red for an LED because no matter what type of robot design it is, if your robot's eye is red, everyone's gonna see it as evil. Everybody's gonna see it as evil. No matter what you do, no matter how you try it, no matter how much you explain to you, it's kind and friendly as a red eye. They're gonna just think it's gonna be, it's gonna kill them, it's the first eye. But at the same time, look how much it works though, because of course we have HAL 9000, which we all know is a very much killer robot. AI system, but at the same time, if you change his eye to like blue, I feel a little less threatened. You know, a little, like it's gonna nicely kill me, at least. Like maybe not, you know, the airlock, maybe like, you know, small toxin that'll put me to sleep first. Of course, color theory works for aesthetics as well. So these are two of my projects, of course, using you as an example again, aren't you popular? Um, <laughs> and my other spider bot, Paradoxy. So color theory works for aesthetics as well. Um, I'm a big fan of steampunk. A lot of people who know me know I love steampunk stuff. So I definitely follow the steampunk culture when it comes to using black, golds, coppers. And I use that for my spider robot. That's a paradoxy. You can find more of that on my Instagram and stuff, but that's how that works. And then when it comes to like making more of a metallic, futuristic look, I use blue, silvers, and blacks because that's more of a clean type of color thing. So when you're working with your robots and design your own robots, try to think of aesthetics too because is the aesthetic you're trying to bring also fitting the color concept. So, you know, more food for thought. And my favorite one, the illusion of life. Now, this is my favorite part of building any robot. Um, so in art school, they made us read this book so many times. I, I was an illustration major. This is an animation book, and they still made us go through it. But animation, they have what they call illusion of life. So things like dropping a ball, you animate it in a way that it, elongates near the end, it squishes, and then it elongates up before getting the original shape again. And you see it in character designs, you see it in cartoons, you see it in all these type of animations as well, and it's pretty much just faking like this thing is alive. And funny thing about it, it works for robots as well. So here's a fun little video thing of all of my, some of my other projects, but they all carry what I like to call the illusion of life. So one of my favorite codes to use is just a random moving servo code. I use it, I've been using it for years. I use it with a pro trinket. I use it with a whole bunch of stuff. So here on the right with all the spiders, they're all using the same board and the same code. I just made them different colors, but that became one of my most popular posts of them just looking around because they have so much life to it. It's not doing anything. It has no sensors. It's literally just moving around. It has the illusion of life. It's not doing anything that you would assume or would think that it's alive, but since it's just a simple random movement, and as humans, we don't like things that sit still. I don't know why we don't, but it's just a creepy thing. Like, have you ever seen someone just stand still? Like, even the military is kind of unnerving. So making small little movements in your robotic projects, even if it's like a small like rumble or a jiggle or even like a reset from like foot to foot, it gives us a little bit more of an illusion of life. It shows that, hey, this is more than just a robot or a toy or a thing. It has some life to it. Um, a good example here, which we have on stage here, is Orbit. Perfect example of the illusion of life. This is not alive. It's adorable. It's rolling around in a circle right now. But it's currently, you know, gonna break the illusionary thing. Being controlled, which by my wonderful coworker who's out there somewhere, it's, it's bright right now, I can't see nobody. Uh, <laughs> He's out there somewhere. But the head is actually programmed and controlled separately. It's using that same random code. And I've been driving him around all day at this event and how it looks up at people and kind of stares at them for a second before looking around it brings so much life to this one project. And of course we have Fur, which has a lot of life to it because it has an actual AI system working in it. It has a timer for like looking back and forth. But what I did for Fur is I, do I have the button on? The little antenna is actually programmed to move randomly. The antenna does not do anything special. It doesn't light up or when it sees a person, it should, but I didn't get that far. But it moves at random intervals and it gives this little character so much more 
character just from having that small little bit of random movement. So PS, random movement, good thing. <laughs> These are some more like fun examples. Of course, I am a big Disney fan, so Baymax is like my dream robot. If I ever get to the scale level that I need to, I will build him. But like even small little things to have the illusion that life works. Baymax is the perfect example of robot programming. When he sees a new person, even in his like new animated show, if you guys saw it, as soon as he sees a new person, he walks up to him and says, hello, I am Baymax. That's a weird thing to have, but it gives an illusion of life. He waves at everybody. Like, you don't have to wave, you're a robot. Uh, BB-8 is another good example, which I think he's, I'm not a fan of BB-8 in general, but I love his design because since it's a ball, it's constantly moving. It's constantly trying to rebalance itself, and that gives so much life to the character. And of course, I just had a little video of like me teaching Fur how to see people. I just thought that would be fun to share. It's very fun just going like this when he was first learning. It's baby pictures, we have moments. <laughs> so. As you saw, my talk wasn't that long. I just thought I wanted to share things with you. But this is a good process. This is how I usually do things, from sketch, from 3D design, to final project. This is how I do robotics. And thank you for joining me and my robotics guide to robotics. <laughs>